Welcome to the show. I have a special guest here today. I met her mother in person at an airport. We started talking. She told me about her daughter. This is Ashley Buggy and the things we have in common. I'm so glad your mom and I connected at the airport and that she was able to connect me to you. Uh, what we have in common is that we are widows. And what we have also in common is that I was a widow when my son was a young child and you are now a widow of young children. So it's, it's a tough topic, but you are a huge source of inspiration. So I'm glad you're here. Thanks for being here. No, well, thank you so much for having me here. And thanks to my mom for stopping at the airport bar on her way. <laughs> we Diego. were in Austin, Texas, <laughs> and we got to talking and she, I think she asked me what I do for a living. And I told her about the Don't Wait Project and my book, Big Shoes. And she said, oh, my daughter writes. And then once she knew that I was a widow, then she was telling me about you and she gave me your number and she said, don't, don't worry. She doesn't mind me calling you, you calling her anytime. <laughs> so you and I connected via zoom, uh, several months yeah. ago, and then we get to meet next week in person. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Me in the meantime, thanks special. for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Let's share uh, with the audience a bit about your life, uh, before your husband's accident. And we'll share a bit about his story and, and your loss of him. Yeah, so uh, my husband's name was Brian. Um, he and I dated in our early 20s. Um, it was kind of one of those love at first sight moments um, for him. <laughs> so much for me. Uh, as a young 20 year old, I just wanted to travel and explore and finish school and kind of do all the young 20 year old things. Uh, and he was a, I want to join the military, get married, settle down, have a thousand babies and have my life planned out from here. So um, didn't work out in our early 20s. We went our separate ways for almost 10 years. And I did all of those things that I wanted to do. I traveled the world. I didn't quite finish school, but did finish school um, and just kind of lived this really adventurous life. And then circumstances happened where we came back to each other's lives via social media, I guess. Um, and we both happened to be single and we both kind of were like, oh, is this, is this now the time? And uh, it worked out where he had lived his own life the way that he had wanted to. He had traveled the world. He had joined the Navy. Um, and he had kind of done all of the things that he wanted to. And I had done all these things that I had wanted to. And we came together and then were able to do all the things that we wanted to do together. We got married in 2013 and then got to do all of those things, travel the world together, live this really beautiful military life together, started bringing babies and dogs into the mix and <laughs> um, just kind of had this like idyllic life together. And it was like, you know, they, they say it's what storybooks are made of, but it really was. And now it actually is. <laughs> right. In the book, we'll well. talk about your many books. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. When yeah. you, um, so your husband had an accident. Let's talk about that. So people know the context of um, his passing. Sure. So part of um, both of our personalities were just travel and adventure and exploration and kind of pushing the limits of what we could see and do as individuals and then as a couple and as a family. Um, and part of that was learning to scuba dive. And both of us have always had this just draw and passion to the ocean. Um, and so we learned to scuba dive together. And then while I was pregnant with each of our babies, he continued on in his training. Um, and we eventually got stationed in Honolulu, Hawaii, and he had the opportunity to do some very technical scuba diving training. Um, and then unfortunately on one of those training dives, he passed away. He drowned, um, very near our home in Hawaii. And you were pregnant with your third child when he passed. Yeah, I was six months pregnant uh, with our youngest. Uh, I've heard stories of that happening. Uh, families who are a, a woman who's expecting when her husband passes. And I cannot imagine there's yeah. probably this great blessing of him coming into the world again through your child and then him not being there for that. I, I can't even imagine. So I, um, I, I feel that I feel for you in that instance, but I also want to share with people. One of the things that has really been inspiring about you for me is the way that you continue to honor him. There's this quote 
that I read a long time ago that says, so long as you speak my name, I shall never die. And that's how I think. And that's how I navigate the loss of my late husband, Wesley, especially when there's a child involved. I can't imagine not talking about his dead dad every time about his dad every time I think of him or I think of something I see and it reminds me of him, whatever it is, because that's how their memory stays alive in us and in our children. Yeah. And so you yeah. can continue that. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's really hard to talk about, not about him, but about the accident itself. Sure. Sometimes, you know, I talk about it a lot and I write about it. Um, and then sometimes I think, especially when someone else has been through something similar, it just kind of hits you differently. It's like a gut punch. Cause you relive some of those shared experiences a little more. I'm having a little of that right now. So excuse me if I stumble over my words during, uh, you are in a safe place here, <laughs> Ashley, no doubt yeah. about it. Uh, safe place here. Yeah. And I, similarly to you, uh, my work is a lot about sharing his story and about making sure people understand patient advocacy and and different ways of navigating healthcare. And I've resisted that sometimes too, because the job on earth of being Hunter's mom and honoring his father is one thing and not as a job, but as a, as a role in my life that I take right. seriously. But then to add the responsibility of it being part of the work I do in the world, sometimes I really need the separation from that because those yeah. two things are not the same. Wesley, Hunter and me is not the same as me standing and giving a keynote about patient advocacy and what we endured in his illness, two separate things. Mm -hmm. And um, so it makes it very hard to kind of tap into these different parts of where they hit me. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, depending on the month of the year and what's going on in our lives, um, to answer your previous question, uh, yes, my youngest, obviously, I was pregnant with her, so she will never have the opportunity to meet her dad. So the only thing or things she knows about him are the things that I share or that, um, you know, I surround her with or the people I surround her with that knew him. That's her only access to her dad. Um, my younger, my other kids were one and three when he passed. So my three-year-old has some very slight memories. My one-year-old doesn't. Um, but they at least have photos and videos of him playing with them. And, and those are treasured things for them. Um, I was telling you this a little bit earlier, but my youngest is now at a point where she knows she has a dad or had a dad. Um, and she doesn't, you know, Hudson and Izzy, my older ones, they, they talk about him and they share stories. She wants to be included in that. So she inserts herself in stories of him as well. And, and she'll tell me this one time in Hawaii when he took her ice skating. Well, that obviously didn't happen, but to her, she wants those memories. And so it's really important to me to keep his name alive and to keep him a part of our family. And, um, you know, I have a very like realist look at all of this. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people say, well, he's looking down on your, he's still a part of your family or, you know, those are very warm, nice thoughts, but that's not super comforting to me because he's really not, he's not here. And I'm unfortunately left to deal with the real situation of him not being here. So um, our approach to all of this is talk about who he was and the things that he did with us and for us and things that he would have loved to have done and to share his story as far and wide as we possibly can. So other people know the man that he was, are able to see the children that were a part of him and learn from his diving accident. That's especially, you know, a cause that's near and dear to me now since he died in a preventable diving accident is helping other people understand what happens so their families don't have to suffer the same thing.
like what I'm doing is right. And in this moment on the sailboat with our three kids here doing something crazy adventurous and fun in a beautiful location, the conversations that we had. This is where he wants to be. It feels like he's here with us. It's pretty amazing. We are talking with Ashley Buggy. I, as I said in earlier in the show, I met her mom in an airport and she connected us. What we have in common is widowhood. Uh, you are in the beginning part of it. And I have, I offer myself up to you for the rest of my life. However, I can be of support to you having been there myself for the last 18 years. Uh, you are doing a beautiful job. I must say um, your new book, the ocean is calling a true story of love and lost by the sea. Let's talk about that because one of the things that you and I talked about the very first time we connected via Zoom privately several months ago is the dive on his anniversary and, and the different ways that his, his friends were planning to honor him and you at the last minute decided, I need to be there. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, that was one of the big things that we had connected over was scuba diving and our love for the ocean. Um, he died when we were living in Hawaii, <clears throat> um, being that I was pregnant when he passed away, um, saving you all <laughs> the ins and outs of that. Uh, I, it quickly became a high risk pregnancy, which means I had to either leave the island or stay on the island and wait till I gave birth. I decided to leave the island and moved my kids and myself off the island. Um, about five weeks after he died. And I was pretty convinced that I would never scuba dive again. Like the only way to prevent myself from dying in a diving accident would be to never dive again. Um, then a few months after he passed away, um, he had been an organ donor and uh, we've had him cremated for his wishes. Um, and I was approached by this company um, based out of San Diego who turns remains into living reef memorials. And they offered to donate a living reef memorial to my family, um, which means they take his ashes and organic material and turn it into a reef. And then it's placed on the ocean floor, typically in San Diego. Um, I really wanted to place him in Hawaii, the place that he had died and the place that we had loved and learned to dive together. And so, you know, a few months of planning and organization, um, I had that reef flown to Hawaii and assembled his dive team all to fly to Hawaii who were going to place the reef. And at that point, I was still like, well, I, I can't dive because I don't want to die in a diving accident and leave my three kids orphans. But as the days approached and all the planning was kind of taking place, it kind of became this... Um, like a balance of what am I going to regret more, uh, diving given the risk or seeing everyone else dive and knowing I could be down there putting him on the ocean floor and saying my final goodbye. And it really kind of weighed heavily on me. Um, I talked to his dive team about it and made the decision that I was going to do the dive and I was going to uh, honor him in that way and say my final goodbye underwater where he had died. And so on the one year anniversary, we all flew to Hawaii. My kids uh, were on a sailboat that he had previously sailed uh, from Seattle to Hawaii. Um, when we moved there, they watched me dive for the very first time after losing him. And I was part of that team that placed uh, him on the ocean floor. And so obviously no regrets about doing that. No regrets. It was very hard though. I have never experienced hysterically crying underwater. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the first for that. And a lot of anxiety, a lot of nerves, but his dive team- Took good care of you, I'd imagine. Divers. 
yes, promised me they wouldn't leave my side, but it literally held my hand through the whole thing. Just grateful for that experience and being able to get back into the, into the waters that we love and um, find my way back into this. I think sometimes too, I mean, I've, I've, I've made decisions about how I navigate my life when Hunter was younger, that, that is something that people who, who haven't lost a spouse and have a, a child cannot possibly understand. Even my own parents can't understand it. Right. And they love me and they love Hunter, but they haven't lost each other when we were young. And so yeah. it's so very hard for people to relate to sometimes. And um, so I think that even, even my, my will and the living trust and the testamentary, I mean, everything, if I flew, if I left for business or something, or I had a meeting out of town and I flew, I would always make sure everything was all in order. Not, you know, if something needed to change, I'd put a note in there or I'd text my, his godmother, who's, who's one of my dearest friends and say, Hey, flying out this and that. And she was always going to say, you'll be back. It'll be just fine. Have a great time. Yeah. We've got this, you know? Um, especially when he was younger, uh, a lot of people too, even choosing guardians, people don't want to have to think about that. And you have to think about it a little harder when there's just one of you left and take that kind of stuff very seriously. When you decided you've written two books, tell me the other two. Yeah. So uh, my first one was called always coming back home. And that was the love story of, of Brian and I of um, living our separate lives and coming back together living this full adventurous life. And then it leads up to it includes his death. Um, and then a hui ho until we meet again is a book I co-wrote with my children uh, for other children who have experienced the loss of a parent. And that works through the sights and sounds and fears and feelings um, that young kids go through when experiencing that. And then the newest book, The Ocean is Calling. Tell us about that. It's coming out in October. Yeah, it comes out in October. This one, they're all a labor of love, but this one um, you really feel and see inside of what happens and happen, what happens and happened, I guess, uh, through all of this. So it starts where Brian dies and it goes through suicidal ideation, being pregnant, um, trying to navigate a funeral and a second birthday party the day before a funeral and making the decision to move off the island giving birth alone and then trying to figure out what to do from there do I um, kill myself and end this pain or do I figure out how to now raise three children one of them a newborn um, in a place I didn't want to live which was Idaho um, away from my home away from my friends away from the life that I had just fully loved and been living and um, then it leads up to and includes moving to the Pacific Northwest, settling here and really figuring things out, making the decision to power through and to change how we do things and how we see things and how we feel things and really um, embracing this tomorrow might never come. So we need to make the most of today um, and what we have and what we all have together and um, part of that for my family included a two month backpacking trip through Europe with all three of my kids and myself. <laughs> and so I take readers through this healing journey that I took my kids on when they were not even one, three and five and talks about the things that we encountered, the things that we saw. Um, and that was one year after losing him. Well, the book is called The Ocean is Calling, The True Story of Love and Lost by the Sea. It comes out in October, wherever books are sold. Uh, let's take one more break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the all-female expedition team you're part of. And the things sometimes that come to us from the losses we suffer, that we can turn into something that never would have happened without that experience. I call it, you know, just trying to find the balance somewhere in all of this, right? We're talking with Ashley Buggy. We'll be back in just a moment. We are back talking with Ashley Buggy. Uh, we were talking about the things that come to us in our lives sometimes through the tragedies that we experience. And one of them, you did a documentary advocating for dive, diver safety, scuba diving safety called If Only, and that was in 2020. And from that, 
now you're part of an all-female expedition team. Tell us about that <laughs> in the only four minutes we have left, darn it. <laughs> yeah, the founder of this all-female expedition team saw the documentary. She's a diver herself and reached out and said, basically, who are you? Who are you that you have the confidence and the courage to, to share these stories? Um, and in such a powerful and inspiring way, I need you to be a part of this team. And I thought, wait, what? Like, what? I'm a, I'm a single mom. Like, I'm literally changing diapers right now. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of turned into now I'm a master scuba diver and I am leaving for a polar expedition in Norway this November uh, with 34 sea women from around the world. And we'll be doing ocean research um, out in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. <laughs> And you've done, have you gone with the team yet before, or is this your first expedition with them? This will be it. Our first one was supposed to be 2020 COVID put a wrench in things, but we've been planning. I had a three hour meeting with them this morning, um, but this will be the first time we're all together this November. Well, it sounds like another book to me. I think it might be. I've been kind of like, do I want to write about it? Yes, of course I want to write about it. I'm a writer. I love to share stories. I'm a storyteller. Um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> you know, and, and just in the couple minutes we have left, I just want to say too that, you know, you've, you've mentioned a couple of times in this discussion as well as discussions you and I have had previously that you weigh the risk and reward. And I don't think there's anything better than your children seeing you go on and living the life you lived before the loss of their father. And them getting to see that, you know, like we said, that spirit of him live on in you as well as your children, but in you as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I want them to take his experience, take our experience and do something with it. I don't want that to mean that the world is scary and that means we can't do anything. Um, realistically, the world is scary and a lot of bad things can happen, but a lot of good things can really happen too if you put yourself out there. And the reality is, is that we could get hurt, injured, sick, die in any way. Um, but it's more about the living and, the, and what you do with your time here than anything else. And I include them in almost all of our travels and adventures and as much as I can. So they're really living these really incredible lives as four, six and eight year olds, you know, they've done a lot more than a lot of grownups that I know. And it's just really cool to know that even though Brian's not here to see it and be a part of it, they will go on and live this really cool life um, doing things that he likely would have if he were still here. And that's a really beautiful, special thing to, for me to, to hold. Well, I've offered you uh, my, whatever I can offer you over the years as I've navigated widowhood a few years ahead of you, almost two decades ahead of you, uh, but I'm going to hold on to you too, because I'm going to learn a lot from you. <laughs> so I look forward to meeting you next week when I come over yes. to your side of the mountains and we will, uh, we will continue this conversation. Thank you so much for being here, Ashley. No, this is so special. Thank you, Lisa, and to all of your listeners. I really appreciate your time. Take care. I'll see you soon.